Welcome to all of you on this 10th Sunday after Pentecost. We're glad to have you all with us. Will you please be sure to read the announcements in the bulletin, especially the ones about the luncheon on the lawn tomorrow at 12 noon, and also the poster in the Nardex still has some little cards for you to get items for orphan grade train school kits. One of our annual ventures here. The bulletin and service materials are available also from our Cheshire Lutheran Church homepage for those of you who are at home or wherever you may be this morning. Will you please join us for Lemonade on the Lawn out in front after the service today? Next, there will be no Holy Communion this morning. We will celebrate the sacrament next on Sunday, August 15. Pastor Romold is taking some time off. And we'll be back in the office a week from tomorrow morning Monday, August 9th. Our secretary, Carol, is also taking time off this week. So the church office will be closed until a week from tomorrow. Finally, there will be then no bulletins available outside the church on Thursday this week. So much for the announcements. May the Lord bless our worship this morning.
Can you please stand as we sing the opening hymn? Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. These all look to you. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with goodness. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Merciful Father, you gave your Son Jesus to the earth of the Lord. Grant us faith to peace on him in your word and sacraments, that we may be nourished from the life of the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
It is where the 10th Sunday after Pentecost from the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, What would we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt? When we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out of this, into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepared what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it is the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what we are, that you grumble against us. And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat, meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you should know that I am the Lord your God. And in the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, finest frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the Lord. Thank you, God. Psalm is number 145, verses 10 to 21. You read it as indicated, the pulpit side, the numbered verses, and the font side, odd numbered verses.
The epistle for today is from Ephesians chapter 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one home that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, but what does it mean when he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended, far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came to the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats, and out of the sea they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated for the singing of the hymn. given this sermon the title Differing Gifts but only one Holy Spirit and it's based upon this morning's second lesson which you might want to keep in front of you as we proceed. My dear Christian friends in this sermon I want to put in a good word for the church not just for this congregation, but for all God's redeemed people everywhere. It's no secret that in recent years the church has suffered from an erosion, from an erosion of confidence and respect. Not only from the outside, but also from inside its ranks. We're accused of being hypocrites. We're told that our Sunday morning worship is boring, that our sermons and hymns are dull, and that the gospel we proclaim is, well, just no longer relevant today. But whatever society's verdict on us may be, God still has a plan for 
for his church. And his plan is that you and I are to be his daily advertisements to the world and to one another of what it means to live under God. God regards each of us as important. We may not always think of ourselves as important, but God does. And he's given each of us specific gifts and talents to be used not just for our own personal benefit, but also for the well-being of others. I call your attention to St. Paul's description of the church in today's second lesson as Christ's body. Many members, many parts, that is, but only one body. Differing gifts, but only one Holy Spirit. This is who we are and how closely we are related to one another and to him. Once again, in Christ's church, individual persons matter. Each of us is talented, charismatic, if you will, with gifts given to us by God's own Holy Spirit. That means that each of us have duties to perform, responsibilities to carry out for the good of the whole body. Unfortunately, that word charismatic has been narrowed in meaning today to just designate only those people who have radiant personalities, people who can win elections or command multi-million dollar salaries for playing professional football or basketball or baseball or golf or who can win gold medals in the Olympics. But in the Bible, the word charismatic refers to every single one of us in whom God's Holy Spirit lives and breathes, the Spirit given to us through holy baptism, empowering us to do our part for the good of our families, for the good of our workplaces, our society, and in Christ's church. The world may or may not think that your or my particular gifts and talents are worth much, but God thinks highly of them, since his spirit has endowed us with them. Let me tell you a rather homely animal story. One you, if you've heard it before, bear with me. One that illustrates beautifully one of the points that I want to make in this sermon. It's about a puppy. A puppy who had just been bought by a farmer and was taking its first stroll around the farm. At the stable, the puppy met a horse. And the horse said to him, you'll soon discover that the master loves me most because I help him get all his heavy work done. You're too small to be of any help around here. In an adjoining stall, the puppy met a cow who said, I have the most honored position here because I not only give milk, the mistress can also use my milk to make butter and cheese. You have nothing like that to give. A sheep said, I give the master wool to make clothes for his people and thereby provide work for them. You can't give anything like that. The other animals chimed in in a similar way. The chickens bragged about the eggs they produced. The cat about how it kept the house and the barn free from mice. And the puppy became more and more despondent about all the things it could not do. Until at the end of the day, you know where this is going. When the master came to enter the house for supper, 
The puppy ran over to him as puppies instinctively do, wagged its tail, licked his hands and jumped up into his arms. And the master gently stroked the puppy's brow and said, no matter how tired I am at the end of the day, I know I'm always going to feel better when I see your tail wagging and you running to greet me. I wouldn't trade you for any other animal on this farm. As I said a moment ago, as God sees us, each of us is special with individual God-given gifts and talents. Ah, but there is also a flip side to this truth, and that is that the family of God is just as important as are its individual members. Anyone who claims to be a Christian but who refuses to be a part of Christ's church, the family of God, just doesn't understand what it means to be a Christian. By definition, to be a Christian means to be related to and responsible for every other Christian. Even as I cannot be my father's son without also being a brother to all my siblings, so I cannot be my heavenly father's son without also being a brother to all the other children in his family. The church, so it is also with each of you. I would think that's obvious, wouldn't you? Think of an arm, A-R-M. What a magnificent creation of God it is, designed to do so many things well. But an arm is not really a gift, is it? Except when it's an integral part of the human body, doing day after day what an arm is designed by God to do. An arm by itself, severed from the body, is grotesque. Another one of the most refreshing aspects of this biblical truth that we're pondering is that all of us have been freed by God from having to be everything to everybody. None of us need ever feel that we must be it all, know it all, say it all, or do it. Wholeness is in the body, not in any one of its individuals. This is not my truth, it's what St. Paul is telling us in that rather complex sentence of his in today's second lesson. You can follow it along again if you wish. Verse 15, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Can I say it one more time? The wholeness is in the body, the body of which Christ is the head, and we are the members. So when we pray for the whole church of God, as we will do in a few moments, we are praying not just for the well-being of this congregation, nor even just for the well-being of the world's nearly 70 million Lutherans. We are praying for all God's redeemed people everywhere who come together each week to do what we're doing at this very moment, to hear the word of God, to give praise, prayer, praise, and give thanks. We give thanks to God for their strengths, our fellow Christians, and we pray for them in their weaknesses, even as we are grateful for their prayers and their good works on our behalf. Will you, each of you right now as I'm speaking, silently ask God 
to bless the church where you were baptized, if you remember what that was. And if you don't remember, you might want to this week make an effort to find out where it was. Will you also ask God to bless the church where you first confirmed your faith as a teenager or whether you did it later in life? Will you ask God for his blessing upon the church where you were married? And for the church from which your parents, if they're no longer living, were married? This is all what we're talking about this morning. And for the church or churches which in years past helped to nourish you in faith prior to your becoming part of this congregation. And finally, will you kindly ask yourself whether you as a Christian are still growing today in faith and in love as a part of the body of Christ? One way to measure whether you are or aren't growing is the degree to which you are aware that your Christian faith is not just about Jesus and you. It's not just that. You are a part of a worldwide company of believers. Many members, as Paul says, yet one body, differing gifts, yet one Holy Spirit. So now we've come full circle, right back to the point with which this sermon began. This is the way God has designed Christ's church. And that's true in spite of all our cultural and doctrinal and denominational differences. Christ loves the whole church and has given himself for it. So may God keep on giving to each of us and to all of us a rich measure of his Holy Spirit that we too may love the church, the whole church, in spite of all of its faults, and give ourselves for it, using our own special blend of God's gifts and talents. And now will you all join me, please, as we sing together our congregation's anniversary hymn, God's redeemed be loved and holy. I'm just starting. <laughs> we'll find it on the inside front cover of our nipple. Will you please stand?
Now we remain standing. It is our privilege to confess our faith in the words of the Apostolic Creed. <laughs> pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, as you once provided for the Israelites during their journey through the wilderness to the land you had promised them, give us confidence now to trust in your promises, to provide for all we need for this life and for the life of the world to come. Lord, in your mercy. Master of the vineyard, bless all pastors, teachers, and lay leaders within Christ's church, that they may be enabled to work diligently, winsomely, and faithfully within your kingdom for the good of the whole body of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. God and Father of all, enable us as husbands and wives, as sons and daughters, as brothers and sisters, and as members of this congregation to live humbly, patiently, lovingly, helpfully, and wisely with one another, enabling us to always maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of all, hear our prayers for the hungry and the homeless. Inspire us to continue to do what we can to provide for them not only bread to satisfy their bodily hunger, but above all and most importantly, the bread of life Jesus Christ, who alone can satisfy every need of our bodies and souls. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, grant renewed health to all who are sick and hospitalized, especially to those who we now name silently in our hearts.
empower doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals to give good and gracious care to all who need healing, whether of body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, enable us to remember always who we are by your grace. Name me your redeemed and forgiven people through holy baptism. And that you have promised us that nothing will ever be able to separate us from your forgiving love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we give thanks for all those dear ones of ours who have gone before us into heaven. May your Holy Spirit keep a firm grip on the faith of each of us until the day comes when we are privileged to join them in your nearer presence. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those of us. And forgive us our temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Before I may speak the blessing, may I ask this of all of you that immediately following the closing hymn, while you are standing and before you leave, will you turn to those in the pews behind you and in front of you? And tell them that you're glad they're here with us this morning. Just tell them that. And if you don't know who they are, ask them their names. And listen when they tell you. And then tell them your name. Let's make an effort to become closer together to one another. And then make your way up toward the lemonade. <laughs> now will you please stand the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Now we sing. <laughs> Thank you. 